This is Sean, RJ, and Bobby on DFW Sports Station as we welcome in the radio voice of the Dallas Mavericks, Chuck Cooperstein, on the DNM Leasing Hotline here on 105.3 The Fan after last night's call. Good morning, Chuck. How are you? Good morning, guys. How are you? Doing well. Your initial reaction when the Mavericks made these moves for P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford compared to what you've seen through two games? Um, it's about what I thought it would be. I mean, I think Gaffer's actually been a little bit better, <laughs> maybe even than I thought he'd be. I knew he was really good uh, playing on a bad team, but I didn't r- realize that the, he could be this impactful this soon. Um, you know, Washington's career has been very up and down when he's good, like he was on Saturday. He's really, really good uh, when he's not kind of in the game like he was last night. Um, he's, uh, you know... He's a, he's a work in progress. I mean, I, th- I think he was the far more controversial of the trades, uh, even though he probably is the player that the Mavericks really need to be able to produce uh, from. Um, you know, they, they, they gave up a, a first-round pick, an- another pick, which is, you know, okay. I, I really don't necessarily have a problem with that. I mean, there's ev- everything about P.J. Washington's attributes scream that he should be a roaring success. And especially in this system, um, you know, we'll see if uh, if he ultimately is that player. I, there's certainly a chance that he will be, um, uh, and and if for no other reason than he's so happy to be home, that uh, I think ultimately it's it's really going to help him and settle him down. But Gafford has just been out of sight here in two games. Yeah, I'm sitting here watching. I'm like, what was the cost again? And I was like, I know it's a first round pick, Chuck, but. Why weren't more teams falling over themselves? He shoots pretty decent from the line. He seems to be a good dude. He talked about doing all the trash. He's athletic. He's big. He's blocking shots. Were you surprised there wasn't like even more interest? In Gafford? Yes. Just in Gafford? Uh, n- n- not necessarily because, again, the, the center in many ways has been legislated out of the game. Yeah. Um, but from the Mavericks standpoint, the, the Mavericks have been such a bad rebounding team really for two years now that, uh, you know, Luka needed help there. Luka was the only real rebounder they had. And uh, and Gafford obviously gives them another guy along with Lively and actually provides protection for Lively because, let's face it now, you know, Lively's had three major injuries this year that's uh, forced him to miss uh, – about 17, 18 games. Uh, that's a lot of games to miss. Um, and uh, if you go back to the Mavericks championship season of 2011, uh, they had both Tyson Chandler and Brendan Haywood. I mean, they had two legitimate centers that they could always play 48 minutes with a big if they needed to, or if the game sizes down like it did last night, and you know they, uh, the Wizards took Marvin Bagley and, and Holmes out of the game, and they played Kuzma at the five. Well, then you have Maxi Kleber there to be able to play the five. So uh, it al- it certainly allows Jason Kidd a lot more versatility uh, and a lot more rim protection. And basically, let's face it too. I mean, you've got twelve fouls to use from those two guys. And um, at least you know to this point, Gafford hasn't really been a, a foul issue. But there's no reason for either one of those guys, uh, Gafford or Lively, to not be as aggressive as possible. Chuck Cooperstein, voice of the Mavs, joins us here, one hundred five through the fan. Um, how does this change their ceiling? Uh, and their 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 yeah, their ceiling, their chances to win the title or the West. Well, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think they're. I, let's put it this way: they're a better team now than they were before the trades. I mean, I think that's the best way to answer it. Um, you know, they won't be able to play the Clippers anymore this year. They don't play Minnesota anymore this year. Uh, you know, that series is over. they got one more game with Phoenix uh, coming up with the first game out of the All-Star break. Um, you know, they've got a couple of games up in Oklahoma City, including the last game of the year, which probably doesn't mean anything. So, you know, what do we take from uh, the series with Oklahoma City? You know, they got down 30 in one game. They didn't play with Kyrie in that one. And then they almost won, probably should have won. And then they beat him by 35 the other day. What does that mean? Um, I mean, basically what it shows is that they're certainly capable of beating anyone. And and they can do it maybe it with more than just simply uh, shock and awe of of great three point shooting. You know, last night they they were bad last night for a lot of that game. They shot under forty five percent for the game, and I haven't looked this up yet, but there have not been many games this year that the Mavericks have won uh, when they shot below forty five percent. I know they've only won one game all year when they shot below forty. Uh, so. Their defense has improved. 
Uh, they're in a really good run right now in that area. So th- it's not like they need 120 points to win anymore. And to me, that's the most hopeful sign of all. Because when you get to the playoffs, you're not going to be able to, to win, even in this uh, souped-up NBA, uh, just scoring 120 a night. That's just not going to happen. What happened with Grant here? Um, he seems to be doing all right in Charlotte already two games in, but what was the main reason it didn't work? Just think he lost his confidence. He just, you know, he started out great. Listen, if we, if we were having this conversation 15 games of the year, I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation because he, he looked like the player that, that the Mavericks made the big deal for. I mean, he shot the three-pointer great. He was guarding people. He was leading. He was active. He was, you know, had a little edge to him, which the, the team definitely needed. Um, and then he just started missing. And missing begets missing. You know, some people are able to overcome it. You look at a guy like Tim Hardaway. I mean, he was awful last night. But you know, uh, tomorrow night against San Antonio, he instead of going to whatever he went last night, uh, what was he? Uh, he was uh, two of thirteen last night and one for seven. He might go eight for thirteen tomorrow night and five for seven. Right? I mean, that's that's just him. You know, other than a few games, uh, you know, the Sacramento game most notably, uh, Grant just he just lost his confidence offensively, and I think it forced him to lose his confidence defensively. And he got to the point where it was just it became very difficult for the coach to play him. Uh, Chuck, speaking of confidence defensively, it seems like there's a lot of confidence right now from Luka Doncic, the way that he's playing defense. We've, we've seen a bunch of different metrics that are saying he's been an improved defensive player. I know that Luka recently talked about that with J.J. Redick. Uh, how big of a, a boost do you think it's been to get the improved defense from Luka this season? Huge. I mean, the game played is played at both ends of the floor. It's, this is not like football. This is not two platoons or Iowa women's basketball. Where the ball, where you never cross half court, <laughs> okay? I mean, you, you got to play both ends, and uh, it's difficult for the superstar who's being asked to score as much as Luca has been asked to score uh, to to make an attempt at that end of the floor. But to his credit, he absolutely has. Uh, it points to his conditioning uh, in in much better condition this year than probably at any time in his career. Uh, you know, he has a whole team around him now, a nutritionist and a strength and conditioning person, you know, who work, you know, with the Mavericks to make sure that everything is on the same page. And I just think it shows he wants to win. He's all about winning, and he'll do what he has to do. I mean, how many times has he gone to the floor, you know, to try to make sure that, uh, you know, a possession is saved or that the, the Mavericks actually, you know, get a ball that maybe they wouldn't have gotten a, a year ago. Um, it's what's, it, re- it really is what superstars do. And uh, I think ultimately it is going to uh, have a major payoff. And I think we're starting to see that now because the Mavericks finally have gone on a a fairly significant winning streak, their longest winning streak of the year. And, you know, we we talk about the defensive side, but offensively, obviously, that was the the big thrust of the Kyrie Irving trade a year ago. We're a little past a year uh, of that deal being made. What is your general thought on on how this pairing has worked out on offense between Luka and Kyrie? It's been great. Anybody want to say it's not great? <laughs> tell me, and if you want to say it's not great, tell me why it's not great. I mean, it takes tons of pressure off of Luca. Uh, you know, he has somebody else to, you know, bring up the ball and get get them into their offense. And I mean, Kyrie, when he plays, and you know, that's obviously been an issue through the years. And uh, it's been an issue here for uh, you know certainly this season. He's had a couple of pretty significant injuries, but when he plays, he is an offensive wizard. He, I mean, there is no little guy, you know, six two or under that I've ever seen that has the ability to finish at the rim the way he does. Maybe Isaiah Thomas did back in the day uh, for the Pistons, but he he's just incredible in how he does it. Uh, he gets to where he wants. His handle is ridiculous, and he's been a really good teammate. Uh, I mean, I think he he and Luca uh, they seem to get along really well, uh, and I think you know they're they're both looking. Uh, for the one thing that that everybody wants. And obviously Kyrie had it once a long time ago now in 2016. But I think he wants to show that uh, he can get another one. And obviously I mean, we all uh, believe, not just here in Dallas, but uh, else throughout the NBA, that at some point Luka is he's going to win an MVP and he's going to win a title. And, you know, why not now? I mean, I, I don't see anything to suggest that – this doesn't work, and and that comes from the eye test, and that also comes from the metrics. I mean, they're really good together. 
Coop, you mentioned there off the court how how it's worked out well, you know, among his teammates. Why do you think it's worked out better here, or, or or we haven't seen those same sort of issues, I guess, to this point for Kyrie that that he has had in other spots? Well, I think there are several things here. Number one, uh, he's not playing with LeBron. He's not in fishbowl cities like Boston and uh, and New York. I mean, here in Dallas, Ma- the Mavericks are pre will ignored. Uh, you know, personally, uh, they don't get the fishbowl treatment. Uh, the Cowboys get the fishbowl treatment here. Uh, so it really, you know, with all due respect to what we're all doing here right now and, uh, you know, what happens during the course of the regular season, nobody really pays attention until the playoffs. Nobody does. It's not like the Cowboys where it's uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Right. So he can just go and do and be his thing and, and be him. Uh, you know, I think he's got a great relationship with Jason Kidd. You know, the fact that uh, he admired Kidd as a kid, grew up a Nets fan in northern New Jersey uh, when the Nets were good and Kidd was taking him to the NBA Finals. And uh, he's had a long-term relationship with Miko Harrison, too. So I think the the pieces are all in place for him to have a really successful run. And you know, I know there will be the skeptics who are just waiting for the other shoe to drop and who knows, maybe it will at some point, but there's nothing to suggest right now that it will. Voice of the Mavs, Chuck Cooperstein here on 105.3 The Fan. Chuck, did you see or hear what Spencer Dimwitty had to say and why he chose the Lakers over the Mavericks? And if you did hear it, what did you think of the comments? I didn't hear it. Peyton, let's play it for Chuck Cooperstein. I'll give y'all something funny that I told, told my people because I'm fairly candid. Um, the two situations kind of felt like this, right? Let's say you were a kid and you got your ass whooped by the bully. Dallas could have been like your mama being like, it's okay, baby, don't worry about it. Lakers are like, your dad, now nah, you better go out there and, and fight till you win. You feel me? And I just felt like that was what I needed at the time. You feel me? So, um, I'm a big believer in kind of doing what you need to do at whatever time it is. And so that's how I felt about it. What do you think, Chuck? I'm not sure I understand what the hell he's trying to say. <laughs> there, there, there's, you know, I, Spencer was always a great interview um, when he was here. Uh, what he's saying, there's no accountability here. Is that what he's saying? I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, is there accountability in, with the Lakers right now? I mean, you know, the Lakers have what? The Lakers have one title in uh, in. They have, you know, they won their last title a year before the Mavericks won their title. I mean, what's what's going on here? You know, they. They got LeBron, and you've you got the fishbowl existence with LeBron and the passive aggressiveness of, of LeBron. Uh, I, I don't know. He's from L.A. The bottom line is he wanted to go home. Yeah. All right, The Mavericks made a heck of a run to try to get him in here because Jason Kidd uh, and Nico Harrison want a lineup that has three ball handlers and just make you really difficult to, uh, to defend when, you're up, when you have the ball. Um, but, hey, he made the call. Uh, the Mavericks and Lakers don't play each other anymore this year. Uh, so from, from my standpoint, there's really nothing to worry about. Chuck, thank you so much for the time. We appreciate it. Looking forward to the second half of this season and having you on again. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. The voice of the Mavericks, Chuck Cooperstein on the DNM Leasing Hotline. Yeah. 